this rewriting of history in order to show this uh, good and and democratic and liberal world that uh, supposedly we are all fighting for against these evil um, bad guys in China, in Russia, in North Korea, in Venezuela. And so it, there is a, a process of, I don't know if, if this is the wrong word, a stupidization of the, the leaders and probably of the... Hello, everybody. So today I got a somewhat different talk for you all, as I am joined today by another YouTuber who has a Spanish language podcast on geopolitics, and he will be actually, uh, we will be talking to each other about our work and about the way that we, <laughs> we are getting more and more desperate, especially about Europe, because he's also sitting in, he is sitting in Europe, I'm sitting in Asia. Uh, I am Swiss, he is uh, Argentinian. His name is Ezequiel Luis Pistoletti. Uh, so born in Buenos Aires, uh, Ezequiel holds two master's degrees in political science and sociology and a PhD in economics and social sciences. Currently, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Buenos Aires and an international lecturer based in Berlin. In addition, he works as a political analyst in international media, and he is the host of the critical geopolitics channel Demolishing Political Myths, which will be linked below. Ezequiel, thank you very much for coming online today. Hello, Pascal. I'm really glad to be here. Um, you, we have been in contact for a couple of months, and because we work in a similar space, and you've uh, turn, uh, used a couple of the things that I've translated before, um, and we both agreed we have to talk to each other because it's just uh, it's getting worse and worse in Europe. Uh, with this escal escalatory spiral with Russia, and Europe is running the danger of really. Um, getting in getting itself into a conflict which very easily might be going nuclear um you are sitting in germany as a foreigner as an argentinian in germany how do you perceive the the germans germany's reaction to the war in ukraine yeah well um let me begin by saying that I am Argentinian and I have naturally a South American perspective on things, on political things here, but I have lived here for almost 20 years. So I know German media space and society very much. And one of the first things um, that um, really surprised me with regard to the war in Ukraine is the huge discrepancy that you see in the, let's call it hegemonic, generalized view of the conflict between the German view and the European view, the view of the global north, and the view of the global south or even the global majority. Um, these, this anti-Russian rhetoric here, uh, which uh, places uh, Europe and the global north as the only representative of uh, uh, democracy, human rights, uh, international law against a uh, mm, cruel dictatorship and bloody evil leaders of the world. This uh, does not exist beyond or outside of a few countries, including Germany, of the global north. The global south sees this completely differently and uh, not uh, not in a in, in, in somehow in a pro-Russian or anti-Russian view, but in, 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 in the light of a political conflict between big political powers that has to be uh, settled in a negotiated way. So from that neutral perspective, talking about uh, neutrality, from that neutral pers perspective and, and this tr striving for peace, well, that's the common view of this conflict outside of this bubble of uh, German media space and public, not, not public opinion, but publicated opinion. Um, I can also say that I was at the very beginning surprised um, when the conflict started that uh, there were a few months that I would say that German society, the entire German society, got uh, somehow in this loop of uh, completely anti-Russian, Russophobic, uh, pro-Western propaganda wave. 
But after that, I think people got tired of this. People started to understand that there is a war going on and a lot of people dying. So somehow they, they just abandoned the issue. And now what we have is, uh, I'm talking about people on the street, not the media, not the politicians that remain in this loop of warmongering rhetoric. Uh, people on the street, uh, actually, they're disinterested. They have no idea. Um, they barely want to know about the thing, these things. And when you talk with them and mention the possibility of at least a war, uh, a direct war in Europe, not to mention a world war, and the possibility of the use of nuclear weapons, they're like, no, what are you talking about? No, that's impossible. So there is a dissociation between the, at least this this this, this is my my view or my the way I perceive things. There is a dissociation between the elites leaving these countries into a war, the media that follows that naturally, and a completely dissociated society that uh, is not interested, um, doesn't know much about this. And I think in the end, this um, is based on a decay of democracy. And this is something that's been going on for a long time, uh, at least I think since uh, the beginning of uh, neoliberalism as uh, the <laughs> world economic uh, order, this uh, continuous deterioration of democracy in which people do not participate, do not care about. There is a, a complete ignorance of everything that's going on, which is very undemocratic, because if you don't have participation, you don't have democracy. Basically, the idea of democracy is people defining the public sphere. Um, well, you don't have that. And that's what lies behind this way to war without people being massively on the streets. That's I, uh, in general terms how I see I see the situation. I mean, this is, but this is partially by design. I mean, already the Corona topic, but now even more so the war with Ukraine topic. The way that in 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 the public media this is being portrayed is as an issue where you need to ask experts, right? The, and the experts will tell you what has to be done. And we see, at least in Germany, or the, the German uh, uh, shows that I, through the internet, have access to, I see this massive rhetoric of people who, who show up, who tell you that you need to confront Russia, that you need to send the Taurus missiles, and so on and so forth, you know, ever more, and who criticize the government for not doing enough escalation, for being too slow in sending weapons. And then then the, the discussion is usually, yeah, expert says Germany should be fast, should, should act faster and should act more decisively. Why is our uh, governments are reactive. So um, th this discourse is also quite uh, quite bizarre um, looking at also the preferences on the ground because by now we know that there is a good part of the population that actually would rather want to de-escalate. We have now the these statistics that, that came out and we also have now the, the uh, uh, the results of the EU parliamentary elections that came out. We are talking today on the 11th of June. The parliamentary elections were like two, three days ago. And especially in Eastern Germany, the AFD won massively. And on in the Twitter bubble that we have, we now got this, uh, uh, we got a lot of West Germans complaining about the East Germans uh, still being anti-democratic and being anti-social and being, and it's, it's really quite crazy, the, the, the German Twitter bubble on, on, on the, the left Westy side how they blame the east east germans for not being democratic enough for and for supporting putin that's the that's the discourse that's currently going on can you make sense of that i cannot make sense of that because it doesn't make sense um with regards um reg with regards to germany i agree with you on 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 this characterization of german democracy i think german democracy has always been very elitarian very somehow oligarchic it's it is all it's even uh, something that it's said publicly that uh, the country has to be ruled by an illuminated elite not by the masses i i think that some of that um, might be related to german history and the rewriting of history putting the german peoples the people from below 
as a responsible for the coming to power of, of uh, Hitler. I think that's somehow the imaginary that you yeah. have in the constitution that led to the German demo uh, present day uh, democracy. I I'm saying this because I think this is very, very different to the conception of democracy that you have, for instance, in France, where you have the idea or the, the remembrance of uh, the French Revolution and the participation of the people is not seen as, as, as something dangerous as it is um, in, in Germany. So, well, it, that's 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 uh, one of the characteristics of German democracy, and for for sure you can see that in uh, the Ukraine conflict all along. But what I see in the entire Europe, Pascal, is that uh, regardless of the specifics of every country, uh, you have people not participating, not mobilized, and this is what they use in order to do whatever they want. The only problem is that uh, in this case, doing whatever they want, and I'm talking, I'm thinking, for instance, of Ursula von der Leyen, von der Leyen, who was not, um, she was not voted by anyone, and she's one of the main supporters of this uh, military solution to a political problem. I'm thinking of uh, Bor uh, Josef Borrell, uh, and also uh, I'm thinking about all the different politicians that are leading this. Uh, nonsense and uh, there is no distinction between left and right actually because you have um, democratic um, socialists who have this uh, this who follow this line you have um, Christian conservatives who fo who follow this line as well you even have some of the so-called uh, new extreme right such as Meloni who follow this line as well they are all subordinated to the US um, guidance let's call it like like that, and regardless of their own characteristics, they all do the same, and the societies do not react. And I think, in the end, this is the the, the basic reason why we're seeing what we're seeing. Our democracies are not democratic, and when you then see that, um, for instance, um, last uh, Sunday, when you then see that the new so-called popular right or populist right or the new far right, when they receive much more votes that, that, than, that in the past, than in the past, what's going on is not actually that people somehow turn to the right or that the Eastern Germanies are, um, I don't know, more authoritarian than Western uh, German population. You only have people voting against the actual state of uh, the, 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 the actual situation politically and economically, and they are voting for anti-systemic parties, which in this case happen to be happen to belong ha happen to belong to this uh, new extreme right. There are some exceptions like Fizzo in Slovakia, there is the um, this alliance around Sara Wagenknecht, which offer uh, somehow a peace solution to this conflict and a different rhetoric than neoliberalism in economic sense and uh, unipolarity uh, based on the U.S. leadership in the political uh, dimension from a left a leftist perspective. All the others are in the uh, usually populist right parties, but. The, 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 the defining thing is that there are anti-systemic parties, and that's why people are voting for them, uh, just because of that, because all the other parties, the systemic parties, they all follow, they have the same program, actually. And this program is, in, in with regards to Ukraine, having a direct conflict with Russia, which is crazy, because it will destroy Europe, it could become nuclear. And even from a, a, a military perspective, if you think about Europe, Europe is not even prepared for a war. Sorry about that. It's not prepared for a war with Russia. It will be completely destroyed. So it's it's also suicidal as well. Especially now that Russia has already destroyed a, a big part of all the NATO equipment uh, in Ukraine, that 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 the West sent to Ukraine, and that equipment is gone, right? And we know that that Europe cannot really fill up its stockpiles anymore, um, the the NATO countries. But I, you know, this is something that puzzles me so much. How? Okay, we m maybe we also have a a a 
age issue here. Uh, I suppose we are both in our thirties, right? In our late thirties, uh, at least for myself. I'm 42, Pascal. You are? Ah, you're holding up very well. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment, but I'm 42 yeah. already. <laughs> uh, okay, but we are both from the eighties, right? So you're you're in that case from 81, I'm from 85. Um, and we have grown up at the, I don't have any active memories of the Cold War. And then we grew up, we were kids, during this kind of period of hegemonic uh, unipolarity, right? And we we became politically, internationally politically aware, I would say somewhere around 9-11, maybe a little bit before for you, for me, around that time, you know, Yugoslavia, I only have faint memories, but then 9-11, very strong. And and then from there on, we we perceive this, this what's happening in, internationally. And Maybe the problem is that we only have that period. Maybe it was just as bad before. Maybe it was just as crazy. But somehow, as a historian, I get this hunch that that wasn't the case. I really get the hunch that this time we are in something in a new form of Western, maybe a Western version of what, what previously was something that would have happened in, in the Soviet Union, you know, and a a um, a moment when society starts to to demand that everybody march in lockstep, um, which I don't think we had before in Europe. I just can't remember it. Do you, what's your impression on this one? I think there, we are in a qualitative different situation now. Um, in, 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 in several, in several um, senses. Um, what I, the way I interpret this uh, from a, a, a bigger perspective is that we are witnessing the end of the world economic and political order, the world, the the order, the world order that we had since the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall, um, which was in um, the economic dimension and uh, neoliberal uh, world order, which started. Actually, it's uh, the, the first experiments happened in Chile and Argentina in the 70s, but worldwide it started in the 80s with Reagan, with Thatcher, then it accelerated in the 90s with Clinton. This is on the one side, the thing that uh, the, the, the economic structure that is collapsing uh, now, the, um, the crisis of 2008, 2009 was the first big blow to this economic order. The pandemic was probably the knockout. And this is the economic structure that is collapsing uh, in the light of emerging powers such as China, such as Russia, such as India, which have some neoliberal aspects in their economies, but at the same time have a very, very strong state that is able to somehow redirect the economy when there are uh, problems. This is the my economic interpretation of this. And the, the political order that somehow accompanied, that came together with this economic order was the one that it started um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, which was basically the uh, unipolar order with the US as the only yeah. hegemon. And this is falling uh, apart uh, as well. Um, in yeah, part, but... this began... yeah. Sorry, just because the interesting thing is that it's falling apart, but at the same time, it seems to me that the Western alliance of like, I mean, the the collective West, as we as we often refer to it, seems to just harden and to to just even more fall into lockstep as a response to it, or or maybe it it's falling apart because it's going into lockstep, um, because like you know, if if we think about the 1970s and 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 and, and 80s we had ostpolitik of Willy Brandt we had Olaf Palme in 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 Sweden we had Bruno Kreisky in Austria and these were leaders who did things that were not in in this kind of 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 general um, movement and and they they disagreed and we had genuine disagreements and we still had the consensus that um, even though you have politically opposite views, you would still belong to the system. And that was fine. And today it seems to me in Germany, there's a debate whether the AFD has to be has to be banned, right, as a, as a political party. And it's the only big um, outside party. Okay, we have Nazara Wagenknecht as well, but 
her party is very new, so we cannot really say much about it yet. And there seems to be now this idea, this political idea uh, all over the collective West, and we see it in the United States too, that being a good citizen, being a good de uh, democratic participant means to do as you're told. And you're told by the global elites, which usually, which you find in one, two or three parties, but they together, it's like what Jimmy Dore refers to as the uni party, right? They they tell you where to go and anything else is not is not politically acceptable anymore. Do you have, do you have that? How do you see that? I like very much this concept of interregnum, this uh, concept of this Gramscian uh, concept of interregnum. This is a time in which you have somehow a transition. The old order does not uh, completely, has not completely disappeared yet. The new order has not completely emerged. And in the meantime, and during that transition time, the worst things uh, can happen, right? And one of the things that we see happening is this strengthening of uh, repression, of censorship, this undemocratic turn that uh, you are mentioning that we see in all countries of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, every every challenge in discourse is immediately labeled as un undemocratic, as um, somehow uh, pro-Russian, whatever so they, they they have this idea of we are democracy everything that is that differs from us is undemocratic and this is i think um a consequence of that period of transition in which everything can happen the the, the thing that gramsci says about interreniums is that you don't have any certainty that the new emerging order will be necessarily better uh, because this interregnum led actually to the emergence of nazism, of fascism in in Europe. When we had the liberal order of the early uh, 20th century uh, collapsing and not, not we didn't have a new order yet, neither politically nor economically. So in the meantime, we had fascism. And um, the situation now is that we see this hardening of repression, this hardening, this, this decay of democracy in, in the West. And there's absolutely no, no clue about um, self-criticism. Whatever um, someone says something different uh, with regard to this warmongering position that the global elites and the, the, the elites of the global North actually are taking, <clears throat> The first thing that you hear is that you are being disqualified and there is absolutely no um, self-reflection in these in these um, uh, elites. So uh, that's the way I see this 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 process of deterioration of democracy and um, with with um, relation to the past uh, Pascal and 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 the seven you were mentioning some the Oz politic and politicians from the 70s and the 60s um, I think we are way beyond that point of uh, nuclear deterrence actually we are in in uncharted waters now because back then the um, nuclear deterrence basically consisted in, not having direct direct um, confrontations with conventional weapons, no, in conventional military terms between the big powers, because there could be a nuclear response. We passed that long ago. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we have now an almost direct conventional military um, confrontation between um, big powers. So um, yeah, yeah, no, we're we, in uncharted. It, it's it's worse than in fifty eight, if you ask me. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. You you're you're right about that. The we don't have the the um, arms limitation treaties, the various ones we had, the interballistic missile treaty, and so on. Uh, th they are all gone. The only one we still have is the NPT, the non proliferation treaty. That one, luckily, is still in place. But even I mean, we we'll see where where this will go. But the um, we lost a lot. We also lost the consensus uh, between the great powers, between the superpowers, that you will not attack on each other's territory. We now officially have the US, which says like you can use our weapons to strike Russia proper, not just Crimea, not just the Donbas. You can strike Russia proper. This is this is a huge breach of the the uh, United States internal 
previous red lines during the during the Cold War. And this, um, what I can't really wrap my head around is that apparently, you know, the, may, call it a crisis of realism, because realism is based on the idea that countries take decisions that are good for themselves, right? We, we, we have this idea of selfish countries. And what we currently see in Europe, that doesn't work that way. I mean, if an Estonian uh, f uh, foreign minister or even prime minister like says, oh, we have to strike the Russians and so on, and does something that actually is very, very dangerous to their own country because they are front states. If we if we have uh, the, the Europeans now that are willing to risk nuclear annihilation, in order to follow the orders from, from the United States. And we have Nord Stream, the biggest, uh, the biggest um, uh, sabotage on infrastructure in Europe since the Second World War. And all of the European countries just are, are fine with turning a blind eye to that, which hurts them. And then something else is going on and it cannot be explained in realist terms of um, of these countries working in self-interest. So we have to, to go toward the level of the elites and try to figure out why these elites are obviously putting a very different set of values. And they talk about values all the time, right? These globalist loons uh, that I dislike so much. Uh, they put these values way above what actually I would say a lot of people on the ground would prefer in terms of policy. Um, which <laughs> stupid question, but which school of thought do you think at the moment can help us make sense of suicidal Europe? There is no school of thought for that. Um, the um, interpretation that I have, and, and I agree completely with you on this, uh, uh, even though the West has this uh, somehow common policy of uh, uh, continuing the conflict in Ukraine plus opening a new conflict in China through Taiwan and um, you have we have to differentiate uh, the position of the leader of that alliance which is the US for which we can make a particular interpretation of what are their goals if they're good for their national interest but at least they are not just following orders the way Europe is following order. So how do we interpret this um, this shoot in the foot that uh, Europe is, 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 is taking, right? Well, I, I see it from three different perspectives. Um, from the perspective of the leadership, I think there was a complete co-optation of the European leaders uh, by the US. Uh, this could be through money, through corruption, through education, through NGOs uh, or whatever. But uh, basically, you have leaders who follow the orders of the U.S. against the, their, their, their nat the national interests of their own countries. Um, you can see this in, in, in von der Leyen very clearly. Imagine you had a um, president of the <laughs> European Union Commission who was uh, partially raised and educated in the US. Uh, she, um, she was married to, sorry, imagine that you had uh, somebody, somebody there who was raised and educated in Russia and then married to the employee of a Russian pharmaceutical company, which is suspected to have participated in corruption with regards to vaccinations and so on. That would certainly make some noise, I would say. Somebody could call her, hey, you are pro-Russian, you're not pro-European. Well, that's exactly the case, but the other way around, because that's all true with regard to Ursula von der Leyen, von der Leyen and the US. So I think that's the most or um, the most clear case of how the elites have been completely co-opted by the US, either directly or indirectly ideologically. Um, that's from the, 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 the first I mentioned regarding the this this uh, suicidal suicidal um, policies taken followed by by Europe. Then I think there is an economic uh, dimension of this because you cannot understand how the German businessmen, the German industrial bourgeoisie, actually allows this because this is destroying 
European economy and in particular the German industry. The German industry, Pascal, which is the main core of the German economy, that's the uh, locomotive of uh, Europe. It has hundreds of years of history. We all know the German brands of cars and whatever, and they cannot produce here anymore because of this conflict um, which basically led to the destruction of the infrastructure that supplied them with cheap energy. As they do not have cheap energy anymore, they have to take their companies either to uh, China or to the US. So what's going on with them? Where's that, uh, let's say, national industrial bourgeoisie in Germany? which basically says nothing. I, th I remember a few criticisms by uh, BASF uh, CEO at the beginning, but that was it. They're completely subordinated to the US-led uh, policy against their own economic um, interest. And there, I think one of the explanations is the change in the property of the shares of the of the yeah of the shares of the main uh, german industries which as many other sectors of the economy uh, began being bought years ago by this um, by um, blackrock um, uh, funds and um, what is the name of the other big one and i think it's called um, uh, well, i remember the name of this mm -hmm. big funds that us funds that um that have basically bought most of the german and european shares uh, in the industry right yeah. so we have a change in the in the in the economic structure that is leading to this uh, position of the german industry with regard to this conflict which is very bad for them and then again, the third, um, the third uh, dimension of this of this stupid policy by European countries, I think, is again the uh, deterioration of uh, democracy, because these economic and political leaders can bring about these policies because people don't mobilize and don't say stop, we don't want this. They just stay at home. I don't even think that they support this very actively. And as you were saying, pointing out, pointing out uh, before, uh, the latest um, polls show that the silent majority actually does not want war anymore. Uh, but they're, they're, they just stay at yeah. home. They go on with their lives. They do not participate. So we have this, this uh, somehow this cocktail of political elites, economic elites, and people not doing anything and this leads us towards this uh, suicidal uh, direction taken by Europe. Yeah. I guess I guess you are right. I mean, this is probably the most the most sensible way to explain this. That we are really in this kind of how could you call it? You could maybe call it a a process of satellization or uh, the the way that these European countries have become more and more satellites of the U.S. and the elites, especially, are now tethered. To the U.S., not just the political ones, also the the economic elites and the 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 thought leadership and so on. Everything happens through think tanks and so on in the in the U.S. So the the fate and the wishes of the U.S. are by now, to a large extent, also the fate and the wishes of of this group of people who then who then are happy to go forward in a very similar to how at the end of the. The Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union, and the the entire Eastern Bloc, uh, the Bulgaria and um, and Poland and and, uh, um, and Romania a little bit less, Romania a little actually a little bit less, but um, the, the other Eastern European states, uh, including actually on the other side also Mongolia, they were these elites were very much tethered to to the fate of Moscow, and when Moscow said we are not gonna we are not gonna use hard power anymore to prop you up, that's the moment when all of them when all of them went out of the window, right? Um, the and maybe something similar is happening and it's just also that it's not it's not just the direct political and economical interest because even in switzerland which is outside of nato we see this drive of of political um 
like high up stakeholders, not just the politicians, but also the the people in the administration, um, you know, the the bureaucrats who are who are following along with the Western narrative, and that's why well nobody perceives Switzerland anymore as anymore as neutral because they ideologically very clearly took sides. Um, the one of the issues that I have for for Europe is that there's no way of changing that in Switzerland. At least we have these direct democratic instruments. So we were just able to gather hundred uh, more than a hundred thousand signatures, and now we can force a neutrality referendum on Switzerland. This will not happen uh, before three years' time, but we it's forced upon them, and then we can have a public debate about how we want to define neutrality and whether it should be a pro-Western neutrality or whether it should be a more neutral neutrality it might sound stupid, but that's what it's going to boil down to. Um, but there's no there's no such avenues anywhere else, right? Um, parliamentary democracy kind of condemns societies to basically just picking figureheads and then you can do a little bit of protest, but if the protest goes too far, then the state immediately, the figureheads immediately crack down on you. That's it's kind of baked into the system, this this elite preference within parliamentary democracy, isn't it? Well, uh, mm, let's look at the few examples of political movements that tried to change things initially in a structural way in Europe uh, democratically over the last 20 years. And it's very interesting to see that regardless of their political orientation, they will all destroy it. And I'm thinking of uh, Syriza in in right. Greece. Greece, you surely remember it, Podemos in, in Spain, both coming from the left. Then you have the uh, Movimiento Cinco Estrelle in, in Italy, Italy uh, which was actually a centrist uh, movement. Uh, and you even have Meloni to check uh, a, a counterexample of uh, a far right coming movement that was supposed to disrupt this hegemonic rhetoric uh, in both economic and political terms. And in the end, they all had to had to or wanted to uh, somehow subordinate themselves to the NATO um, doctrines and the NATO orders coming from uh, the U.S. This is the, I, I think, uh, Sevin Dagdelem talks about the uh, naturalization of uh, politics in, 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 in Europe and in the, in the global north in general. I would add to all those things that we are mentioning, Pascal, that I also see, and this is very uh, worrying, actually, I see a huge deterioration in the um, how should I call it? The um, political leaders are incredibly ignorant. Have have become incredibly ignorant. I mean, um, in in their education, in their formation, in their conception of history. You listen to to them talk, and they say incredibly uh, stupid things sometimes yeah, i'm, I'm sorry you're laugh. living in germany mm -hmm. you're living in the country of Baerbock, and and what's the what's the name of the of the president of the greens uh, what's her name uh ah, yeah, I, I forgot the name yeah but she's I know also the absolutely long, horrible long hair, yeah yeah um plus uh, uh, struck my um, um uh, struck my this Zimmerman, one from the liberal yeah. uh, struck Zimmerman from the liberals well schultz uh, similar look at macron they're all really shameful. They say they simply say, even if if you consider that they have a different position and whatever, this they, they do not act coherently. They're simply stupid. And and in this in this context, you also see a rewriting of uh, of history as well, um, which suits actually what's going on. You saw this um, last week when the D-Day yeah. uh, was yeah. being um, commemorated uh, that you had, for instance, you had uh, um, Zelensky and Scholz being invited, actually, when, um, <laughs> well, Germany was on the other side and uh, the national, the Ukrainian nationalists uh, back then were also fighting for the Nazis. The Ukrainian state is now uh, officially officially celebrated a figure like Stepan Bandera, and they invite him to celebrate the liberation of Nazism uh, in Europe. Then you have this crazy new idea in Germany that is about uh, Germany being freed of Nazism, which basically erases the basic core uh, of what happened, which is that Germany uh, nourished 
Nazism. There were not only Nazis in Germany, there were Nazis everywhere, actually, but you cannot uh, talk about the uh, Germans being freed of Nazism because this somehow um, erases it, the responsibility of yeah. Germany in creating Nazism. And uh, then you have, for instance, Russia not being invite, invited to this, which basically uh, carried out the, the, the biggest um, war effort in order to defeat uh, Nazism. And I, I'm not consider myself for Russian or whatever, but that's the historic truth. So in light of this um, process of becoming uh, more ignorant, more stupid, you also have this rewriting of history in order to show this uh, good and and democratic and liberal world that uh, supposedly we are all fighting for against these evil um, bad guys in China, in Russia, in North Korea, in Venezuela. And so uh, there is a, a process of, I don't know if, if this is the wrong word, a stupidization of yeah. the, the leaders and probably of the voters as well. I don't know. I don't know. I have more hope into in 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 people because uh, the, the, you don't need to be you don't need a degree in history or in rocket science in order to understand that this what is happening is really really uh, uh, problematic. And we can see how these elites actually, as you correctly said at the beginning, kind of this have this internal despise for the for the for the general population because they they actually also know that this is the people who could uh throw them out of their seats right and, and internally they the whole discourse about democracy and anti-democratic forces the russians are trying to influence our our elections and and the anti-democratic forces of the afd and so on and so forth are all meant to to make sure that the general uh, voting population and actually the people they still need these elites need these people you need them to work you need them to 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 produce to produce goods and you you eventually if you want to go to war you need them to pick up arms and run with a smile on their face toward the bullets and that in that process, right, you want to make sure that the information space is safe. And we hear that discourse as well, right? Disinformation is such a huge topic because the elites are utterly aware that if they don't control the information space, then, well, people aren't that dumb. You really need to proactively propagandize them in order to keep them in a bubble. Um, I... So I have most hope in 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 that part because one of the things we still have is a more or less open discourse base. It's not as open anymore as it used to be, and people lose their jobs over over speaking their minds. But we are still able to speak them more or less, although it's getting less and less. To be honest, um, I don't know. I do you have any hope in 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 actually waking up? Because like we hear that a lot on YouTube, right? When do people wake up? And you and I, we just we we keep saying like, "Hey, everybody, where are you?" I mean, <laughs> can we take away yeah. the blanket for a second? Um, I don't know if I don't know if I share your hope, but do I do share the convincement that that's the only way out? At least if you uh, adhere to democratic uh, principles. So even if there's much hope or less hope that's what we have to strive for that's the only the only the only way out without having uh, as we said in and in a situation of interregnum a situation in which uh, something could emerge in europe like uh, a fascist um, society as it happened in the past i, I know this might uh, sound exaggerated but what we see is a huge deterioration of freedom of speech, of democracy, yeah. uh, of all the, the basic rights. Um, so I, 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 I feel that there is a lot of passivity. That's what I'm trying to, in, in society, that I'm trying to criticize and self-criticize somehow. But um, I do agree with you that that's the only way out because these political elites are leading us right towards a war. And as I said before, this is not even a war that Europe has been prepared for. And I do not think that the U in the case of a direct war, I do not think that the U.S. is going to uh, help Europe, uh, regardless of uh, NATO and and 
the um, fifth um, article of the NATO Charter and so on, I think the U.S. has determined that this conflict has already paid up. So they are starting to redirect their um, foreign policy towards China, which is uh, their main adversary uh, in the world order um, as the main challenger, more than Russia, not militarily, but economically. So I think Europe in the end will be left alone with the burden, burden of uh, the Ukraine war. And the only way out of that is by people waking up. So far, we see just some sparks of light, but we are still far away from a happy ending. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm worried there might not be one. Um, maybe toward the end of this of this talk, um, I would just I'm a little bit curious. Like when you do your podcast from Germany in Spanish, um, are there mm -hmm. any? Um, Where's your main viewership from? Is it actually from Spain or is it from Latin America? And B, um, are there things that you need to explain, you know, that 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 um, that in the Spanish language are not as straightforward as in German, um, which I suppose you live in on, an, on a daily basis, especially in the news bubble? Um, um, well, actually, it's 50-50. My <clears throat> viewership is from Spain, but also from Latin America. So those viewers who watch my uh, channel actually are critical thinking people in the case of the Spaniards, I mean. So they understand the critical perspective that we take. But in the case of Latin Americans, the first question that arises is the one that you just made, uh, Pascal, about what's going on with Europe. Uh, why are they acting so stupidly? And I think this is what everybody in the global south is asking themselves, because they cannot understand this stupid subordination to the US policies against their own uh, national interests. I'm not talking here about uh, just uh, being good or char or doing charity or whatever, just following their own national interests, which they don't. So um, I see, as, as, as I was saying before, this different perspective, this completely different perspective of the uh, regarding this this conflict. And I see again this bubble. Right, uh, that um, Germany and Western Europe, well, not only Western Europe, the West, Europe and um, North America, they they are just in a bubble and people are in a bubble. And all around the world, the views that is shared is the one that we are talking about. Um, yeah, maybe that's the, the main difference between the public that watches my show and the general public uh, in, in Germany, in, in general terms. Yeah. The interesting thing is, of course, also that you and I, we have an implicit understanding because we share a certain view of the world. I mean, we do not think that if uh, Ukraine loses this war, then Vladimir Putin tomorrow will march straight through Europe and all the way to Portugal. We just don't believe that. We we actually listen to what, what comes from Russia when they say that what they want is a stop to NATO uh, enlargement and they want uh, security guarantees that want a, a neutral Ukraine and they want a demilitarized Ukraine. And then we we, we check that and we we feel that, that, that the way that Russia has been conducting the war uh, vindicates our position. I've been talking to us. I have talked to a Swiss historian, and he told me, you know, I don't want war, but I also don't want Srebrenica again. I don't want a genocide. And we and uh, Vladimir Putin is trying to make to, to to commit a genocide in Ukraine. And I'm like, holy Jesus Christ! How can you believe that? Especially when we have a real genocide going on in 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 Gaza, and we see how how you can kill uh, tens of thousands of people uh, people within. A few months and you know israel has killed more people in two months than russia in two years right so either the israelis are just that good at it or the russians are that bad at it and this kind of you know this kind of reality i think you and i in our analysis we share that and then there's this other group of people who doesn't share that analysis who who thoroughly lives in the belief in the belief that if we don't stop them tomorrow, they'll be in Berlin, the, the Russians. Um, they will do that automatically, and Poland is next, right? Um, um, yeah, I, 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 I sometimes I, I wonder myself uh, how many people really believe that nonsense, or 
how many people just reproduce that just in order to make common ordinary people, uh, voters, believe um, that. Um, but uh, with regard to this hypocrisy that you were mentioning, uh, on the one side condemning the terrible actions of uh, Russia and China, and on the other side allowing the um, atrocities, the massacre that is being carried out in in Gaza, I think um, in 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 its core, what lies behind that is uh, somehow some. Uh, supremacist notion of the world there's some supremacism there yeah. in 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 the worldview of uh, the leadership of the global north is we are the democracy we are the freedom we are the good ones so whatever you do russians chinese indians brazilians whatever is bad and whatever we do even if that is committing a genocide is good and this is how we sometimes I, I I am amazed. I am amazed sometimes when I listen to things like, um, well, yeah, um, Israel is bombing civilians, but it is the only uh, democratic state in the region. So beyond uh, that statement, which can be questioned uh, to what extent it has to be uh, questioned Israel... is utterly, completely, ridiculously wrong. But beyond that, yes. <laughs> Beyond that, how how democratic is uh, is um, Israeli politics? But beyond that, um, the idea is: since we are a democracy, we might commit genocide. We might do whatever we want. We might bomb Iraq. We might build, and that's supremacism, right? And the problem now is that that supremacism is not. Uh, based on <laughs> military on 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 uh, on power basically on a, 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 a superior power with regard to the rest of the world and you have new actors emerging that somehow counterbalance that power the US power and the western power does not disappear in this new world order but it has somehow counterbalances and this is what's, what is leading to this nonsense and crazy policies, uh, policies that we see every, um, everywhere. So um, this uh, supremacism issue, I think it is somehow embedded in the heads of many of the uh, Western leaders. And it's, it's very dangerous because um, in situations like this, you, you certainly have read about this, the Thucydides trap. Uh, when you have a, a change of world order, um, the 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 decaying power uh, may try to go down swinging, and in this time of history, that might be a world war with the use of nuclear weapons. So again, even though um, sometimes I well I critic I'm very critical about um, passivity of uh, the role of the societies in the um, global north, I think the only way out of this is just to promote a democratic awakening and just uh, bringing out of power democratically these uh, political and economic elites and uh, create more democratic countries which basically want peace and want better living conditions for everyone and um, socially fairer world than it is right now. Yeah, and weapons are not the way to peace. Democracy is the way to peace. And and every and anyone who tells you pick up a weapon and fight for your for for peace is an idiot and and de deserves to run first. First line. First one to go. Ah, it, this was nice ranting with you about this and also uh trying to make sense of of this of this uh, lunacy because it uh, it mentally hurts but it helps to know that there's others <laughs> who also hurt but at least we <laughs> hurt together um uh, Ezequiel, uh, where can people follow your work um my channel is called um demoliendo mitos de la politica it's in spanish but actually the um, english subtitles on youtube work pretty well so in english it would be demolishing political myths and that's my youtube channel you can find it online and well there are a lot of contents there uh, that are actually on the same critical line than your channel pascal Ezequiel, thank you very much for your time today we'll talk again i thank you i thank you pascal